everyone. Welcome to Open Mind Night, a show that talks about everything mental health related. I am your host, Robin Tamanaha, licensed marriage and family therapist. Joining me on this episode are my guests, Julie Kraft and Shaylee Hugendorn. Uh, Julie Kraft is a Canadian author, artist, and mental health advocate devoted to spreading awareness and shattering stigma. Since her bipolar 2 diagnosis in 2010, Julie has come to a place of fully embracing her bipolar mind. She credits it with allowing her to live a vibrant and full life. Mm -hmm. Julie is thrilled to have published her memoir, The Other Side of Me, and a children's book, Tilda World, both in an effort to start the conversation on mental health at all ages. She has contributed to publications for Psych Central, SciComm, and BP Hope Magazine. Julie currently co-hosts the This Is a Bipolar vlog and podcast. Shaylee Hugendorn is a speaker, blogger, and mental health advocate who aims to dismantle the stigma around mental health and create a safe community for those that struggle. She lives with bipolar 2 disorder and is passionate about educating and empowering others about mental health disorders. She has contributed to publications for Sanctuary Ministries, Psych Central, and BP Hope Magazine. She hosted a series interviewing women with mental illnesses at She Loves Magazine in a series named Sisters in Mental Health. Shaylee currently co-hosts This Is Bipolar podcast. Shaylee is also an elementary school teacher and event planner. Fun. Hi. Hi. I'm so glad to have you both here. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you for having us. It's so fun. I know. I I got so excited because I listened to your podcast and I've been a listen to your podcast for like a very long time, which I love. So, so glad we connected and that you're going to be on the podcast. So I have tons of questions. So we'll just kind of kind of dive right in. And this question is for both of you, but um, maybe we can go with you know, Julie first. Okay. Just out of curiosity, you know, because I, I love that both of you are really authentic, you know, in life and diagnosis and hope and all that. And so I'm just curious, you know, maybe we can start by talking about what your, both of your experiences were with, um, with the diagnosis and what it was like for you. Julie, I'll let you go first. Um, for you, was there like a point, like when you, when you noticed or maybe like suspected that there may have been something within you with a, with a diagnosis or with mental health concerns? Yeah. So I'll go back uh, into my, well, I can go, do a very quick Coles notes version of my life, but um, my anxieties and worries, and I really began to struggle. Um, I would say in my early teen years, our family moved across Canada and that move was devastating for me. It took me from the safety of a small town to um, the big city of Vancouver. And so I pretty much lost my footing and then went into high school, started being worried about everything from the way my voice sounded to how sweaty my hands were, you know, then I was bullied. And so I definitely knew that I was struggling during my teen years and then a very devastating breakup when I was 19. I think looking back, that was really a defining moment for me. And um, from then on, I think life just got more difficult and more difficult. Um, I was married young at 21 and became a young mom, um, but the struggles continued. And so my anxieties then turned to practical mom type things like getting groceries, organizing play dates, um, you know, even driving a car. And so I knew I was struggling, but I, I had no idea that life wasn't really meant to be such a struggle. And then what would happen is I'm a people pleaser. So I would go out and put on this giant mask and smile. And so no one around me knew how much I was struggling. And so of course I would get home and behind closed doors, I think for a lot of us, that's where our true selves come out. And that's where we can sort of let all of our frustrations out. So my husband and my kids took the brunt of just how frustrated I was feeling. Um, And so I knew I was having a hard time, but I don't think I realized how much um, others were noticing. And that was mostly my husband and my kids. And so in hindsight, you know, they have been able to tell me that, you know, my anger outbursts or, you know, my hypomanic episodes, I would be so excited that groceries wouldn't be done and, you know, housework didn't get done. And so, um, I knew I was struggling, but it was actually my husband um, that finally handed down an ultimatum. And he just said, "Um, we can't go on living this way. 
And so that was actually um, what made me seek help. Um, I don't want, I don't know if you want me to continue on with what it was like getting that diagnosis or I can stop talking now, but I mean, that's a process in itself, but um, I didn't, I never suspected bipolar disorder. Um, I didn't even think it was as serious as an official diagnosis. I just knew that, um, you know, anxious thoughts and worries about every single area of my life. And it was definitely affecting, you know, my friendships, but mostly my husband and my kids. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. It's, it's interesting. It sounds like it was very much like internal for you. Like you kind of, and you thought, you know, maybe others had noticed, but it's interesting when, especially those that really get to know you, they kind of see, you know, kind of mm-hmm. see the little, the little things and experience things. Yeah. I'll ask about the diagnosis piece in a minute, but thank you for sharing, <laughs> for sharing that. How about you, Shaylee? Yeah. I loved, I wanted to say something about what you said, Julie. I loved what you said about not knowing, because I think that this question goes with what you're talking about, Robin, is that we only know what's normal for ourselves, right? And we talk about, Julie, I talk about this all the time, like how to explain that bipolar anxiety or mental illness, actual anxiety, diagnosed anxiety is different because you, even when you tried to talk about it with people, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I feel anxious about play dates too. You're like, no, like I actually cannot leave the house with my child to the play date kind of thing. And so anyways, I thought that was really important what Julie said. And I think that it leads into a little bit of mine, same, very, very sensitive. Um, And I don't know if that's like, I don't want to use that in a negative way, but very, um, you know, like I felt things really deeply since I was we, and um, same with Julie in, in high school, I was, you know, up and down, but I, I didn't know any different. And also we know you are up and down in high school, right? So what is, <laughs> you know, you're just worried about what you're going to wear, who you're going to see and all those things. You don't really try to think like, how dramatic is my thinking until something big happens? And it's the strangest thing, but Julie and I both had a devastating breakup. <laughs> So I laugh, but it was like, I was engaged to someone early twenties. Yeah. And, um, thank goodness it ended, (laughs) but it was, it kind of tipped off my first major depression. And then I, um, my baseline is quite high anyways. So I have like a a lot of energy. I talk loud and I'm big hair, big everything. And so um, I think it was really hard for people to know or me to know that to recognize hypomania, right? Because I was already an excitable person. Um, So basically I, you know, I I got married to someone else and um, had my kids and had these up and downs, but mostly went for help because I had the big depressions and mine, and I'm very cyclical every winter, a big depression. So I'd go for help with depression but never knowing that the other side wasn't super healthy either. And so I think that a lot was of mine was brought on t- as well once I had kids, because both Julie and I are quite late for um, an average bipolar diagnosis, right? We were both in our mid to mid thirties ish. And I think another thing that happened to me as well is that we, I was misdiagnosed. So I was put on an SSRI and we know with um, bipolar dis- disorder that we probably shouldn't take. I mean, you're m- no more medical things than me. I'm not very sciencey, but I know for me, that medicine uh, heightened everything and actually kicked off into one of the worst hypomanic episodes I've ever had. So yeah. 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 I'm, I, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because, and that's, I think when it comes to bipolar disorder, I think not everyone knows the range, like it is a spectrum and including mm-hmm. with bipolar too, and, and the differences with the others and how there is that depressive piece. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, like I have seen, it's not at least, you know, since I'm a therapist, like most time people are coming in because they had actually hit a depressive episode yeah. um, as opposed to, because when the hypomania happens, it's like, things are, you know, they're kind of just going, 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 you know, um, and, you know, unless there's a lot of like irritability or other stuff, but for the most part, it's that like depressive piece that they feel. And that's oftentimes what, what brings them in. And it is not uncommon, um, for there to be a misdiagnosis of depression with bipolar two, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And you said both, so both of you, it sounds like we're more diagnosed in, um, you know, thirties for, 
for each of you and, and Shaley, you can go first. Um, what was the diagnosis like, like uh, obtaining that diagnosis? What was your experience with that? Yeah. So I, um, unlike Julie, I knew that like, I knew there was something wrong and that it could be better. Like I just knew that I didn't, I saw other people not be um, completely numb and gray and depressed all winter. I knew that, uh, that there was something. So even as early as university, I was going to ask for help and I would get like a medication or I would finally get in in Canada for the, you know, where I needed to go finally get in to see someone. And then I'd start feeling better. So I, I kept, so then I felt like, why even go for help? Because it never ended up working out. And I knew that if I waited it out till spring, that I would feel better because I'm like clockwork. And I, so I knew, so I was like, I thought that was my life. I just thought, you know what? I had tried medicine. I tried going to the doctors. It, it would just, it just wasn't working out. So I just kind of stopped going. And then um, my chemistry kind of changed when I had, had my girls were the first during those pregnancies. Those were the first two winters that I was okay. I was like, what is going on? Like I kept waiting and I was like, oh my goodness, this is what, you know, neurotypical or people without <laughs> mental health um, issues feel like in the winter. And I was like, I want that. And then I had the kids and then things started happening again. I just couldn't, I, I couldn't take the time to even go get the help or even stay in bed. And so, um, yeah, I just got this other medication because, because of um, depression. And then I was getting anxious. So I even, I was even, di I was diagnosed with a lot of things, but I was diagnosed with postpartum anxiety, which is very different than postpartum depression. We see the sad, the, you know, the baby blues or whatever but it's this anxiety, right? So, I, but I was hyper and anxious. I wasn't like worried anxious. I was just like, I needed to be the best anxious. And um, so that's when I started taking the medication that I told you, we just kept upping it because it's supposed to help with anxiety. Um, and until I ended up in emergency. So I didn't sleep for, I think I slept maybe two to three hours a night for probably a good three weeks. And, um, I also had this big thing going on. I was being this like uh, church youth leader kind of thing. And it was all hyped up. And I thought, oh, surely when that's done, I'll, I'll be able to sleep. And it was like the night after it was done. And it was another night all alone, praying uh, for sleep, um, desperate. And I, I, my brain had convinced me, like, if you actually don't go to sleep soon, like you're going to die. Like, I literally thought I woke my husband up and I said, I need to go to Emerge to get an Ativan because I'm going to die which I'm laughing because obviously when I went, they didn't just give me an Ativan. And so I had to, you know, go through the whole process of telling all the things, but I was really committed because I just couldn't anymore. I just, yeah. I, I didn't want to live through another year of that. And so it was terrifying, but also I think I was so high in hypomania that it took away a little bit of the fear of what this is actually going to mean. I just wanted it to stop. I just wanted to feel better. And so I went there. I didn't get um, committed because I didn't need to be apparently. And so, but I didn't want to go home because they were going to have to wean me off one and do another. And so there's this really cool place. It's a short stay treatment center. And I went there and I could come and go as I pleased, mm -hmm. but I stayed there because I knew there was an awesome psychiatrist there. And I knew that if I stayed there, even though I didn't want to be away from my kids, I knew they would might, I might have some hope of them figuring yeah. something out. And they did there. That's a long okay. story. Yeah. And so that's where the diagnosis when you got the, yeah. The yeah. 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 Okay. So it's pretty um, dramatic, but yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. How about, how about you, Julie? Okay, so I had described earlier how, you know, I was a bit of a self described train wreck. And so it did get to the point there was actually an event, um, probably a week before my husband issued his ultimatum, which I totally understand why he did it. But we had had an argument, and I think it was three in the morning, and I was still stewing about it. And so I got up, I got in the car in my pajamas, revved the engine and, you know, squealed out of the driveway, I had no idea where I was going. So I just went, you know, two streets down and parked. 
And then just, you know, a couple hours later, just said, this is ridiculous. So I went back home. Of course, my husband was fast asleep, hadn't even realized <laughs> that I would left. And so um, I told him in the morning, I said, don't you know, we were fighting all night in my head and I took off. And so, you know, he basically at that point said, you need to go and get help. So mm -hmm. I, it was an appointment that we made with our primary care um, physician. So there wasn't, you know, a specific event when I actually went, I didn't go to emergency or, you know, then I wasn't transferred to a mental health facility. And so in hindsight, I can pinpoint several times when I should have gone probably to the hospital. And mm -hmm. I now know that if I had taken that step as scary as it seemed, I probably would have been diagnosed, you know, a decade earlier wow. and as scary and uncomfortable as that would have been, um, you know, I would have been able to see psychiatrists right away and get the proper care. And so instead I took the stubborn, um, proud route. And so finally we did make that appointment. I didn't want my husband to come with me. He insisted we would go together. And I was basically like a two-year-old adult throwing a tantrum. I did not want to have to admit to a doctor how much I was struggling, um, mm -hmm. but it was just the family care doctor. And it was actually an intern working that day. And I described all of, you know, my symptoms. And she said, I'm not sure, but it sounds like bipolar two disorder. And, you know, all the alarm bells go off. I can't believe she, she nailed it without knowing it. But um, then she looked at me and she said, and I just want you to know that if it is, it's going to be okay because my mm -hmm. father also has bipolar two, And he's mm -hmm. one of the kindest, gentlest, sweetest, most creative humans on the planet. And so that helped, but it didn't ease my fears. Um, she referred me to a psychiatrist and um, I described this um, in my book, just feeling like I needed to put on the best face, um, the best outfit. So I put on heels. I still can't walk in heels to this day, but I just needed to do everything I could to sort of let the psychiatrist know that I was fully in control of every part of my life. And, um, you know, I think that's a result of stigma. You know, I was just everyone in the elevator, even when I was pushing the button up to, you know, the psychiatry floor, I wanted to just let them know, you know, I'm just here for a meeting. I'm <laughs> not a patient. I mean, it's all those things that run through your yeah, head. And so of course, that appointment was not fun. Um, I was asked a million questions, everything from, you know, uh, self-harm to my sex mm -hmm. life to, mm -hmm. you know, how I was a, as a mother, my childhood. And so I wish I could have told myself now that it was all for the end goal of getting yes. a proper diagnosis and getting well and getting help. And I needed to also remind myself that they are the helpers, doctors, psychiatrists, counselors, they're on our side and as comfortable and awful as those questions might be to answer, it's all to get us, you know, that proper diagnosis, which we had talked about, you know, oftentimes that doesn't come right out of the gate. And so I made it through that appointment. And then a few weeks later, went back to my family doctor in which that's when I, you know, heard the words, you have bipolar two, and it's like the world stopped. Mm -hmm. all the feelings. And yeah, it's taken me a long time to wrap my brain around the diagnosis. Um, but I definitely had a flood of a million feelings and felt like this label had been slapped on me. And it was this big secret I would need to keep for the rest of my life. So I was shocked at the words, you know, bipolar mm -hmm. disorder at the first appointment with the intern, but then to actually see it written down on a piece of paper there is something about that, that, you know, I know a lot of people, they struggle with that then becoming their identity and the one thing about them that they'll never, you know, be able to get over. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. It's always interesting to hear like the different, you know, the different journeys, you know, and I know you said like, well, if, you know, I would have known these certain things or these pivotal, you know, points back then the kind of, you know, could have, or should have, you know, type of thing. But I always say, you know, things happen, you know, when they happen, you know, and I think I am really amazed and actually really like, I feel like when you describe when you went to your doctor too, yeah. and like with the intern, I'm like, wow, you know, because it can be complex, you know, mm -hmm. so for someone, you know, to but maybe because of the, the person's personal experience, you know, really yeah. helped to kind of catch things like that was so amazing. And I'm I so know. glad that that, like, that that happened for you. And then also 
that it was in a way where it was really, um, you know, trying to be comforting about it. So maybe because she, since she had a loved one, because it is scary. Like, oh. doesn't matter what the label is, it's like heavy. And like you said, when you see it in writing and then going into the appointment, like that is a lot, a lot to take. And I know for me, I always talk with people about like that, you know, that identity piece, because it's like, you're kind of re <laughs> kind of re looking at yourself. You're like, I'm not oh, yeah. different, but I feel different. Am I different? You know, there's yeah. like so many like floods of like emotions and thoughts and just processing it all. I'm surprised too every time she tells that story because it's uh, I like my GP lovely person and is really good with delivering babies but I actually came to him and we even with my husband we're like we actually think this and it was like no you're put to put together right so it's it seems like a very especially bipolar too it's almost like um I don't know. It, it, it doesn't feel like it's really well understood. However, I am a teacher on call, a substitute teacher, and I don't, you know, a generalist. I don't know how to teach grade 11 math, maybe even grade seven, but I don't know how to teach that. So I look at it kind of like the G, you know, a GP is general and maybe doesn't have a big focus on mental health. So the fact that that happened is amazing. Yeah. And I hope that your listeners know like that might not happen when you go to your GP, but keep, keep going and keep, keep pushing because yeah, if we would have given up, like, I, I feel like that put me back years, that yeah. conversation with my doctor and I don't blame him. He's still my doctor, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Let's see. I have a, a question. You can let me know if this is, um, this is okay or not. I just kind of popped in, but also based yeah. off of what, uh, you know, Julie said, but you know, and also you Shaley, you know, cause I do feel like, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, I think for those that maybe didn't necessarily have the training or personal experience to know, like, you know, nuances or what would be helpful, you know, you know, when it comes to specifically bipolar two, I feel Mm -hmm. like. So for you, do is there anything you feel like would be helpful for people like in general, just like general to know, um, when it comes to, to bipolar two, whether it's like, you know, really what it looks like one, I think, you know, like what you said, Shaylee is like, Oh, you're too put together. Like that's something that's, you know, I, I like kind of cringed a little, you know know what I mean? So even along, you know, that lines or something that's, um, that you found to be like helpful. It's probably a very general question, but I'm (laughs) just kind of throwing it out there. Yeah. I think we talk about that in our podcast. I forget what episode, Mm -hmm. but we talk about how generally, if you think, if you even have any idea or think that you're going into that, we talk about, um, trying to like write things down or record things down, but talk about the mania part. Because getting diagnosed with a depression is, it's pretty easy to get that diagnosis. But you, if you have any inkling, then, and we've talked about too, I know Julia said, like, if you can't think of it yourself, get your partner, like try and look at a cycle of a year. And I, cause I think that's what happened to me, right? Like I'd get better and I wouldn't go see a doctor. So nobody knew the other, other part, right? So we've told people, I, I think it, correct me if I'm wrong, Julie, but that, that we think that that's really important because you actually need that to have at least one hypomanic episode to eat, to get a diagnosis of bipolar two. So if we just talk about the depression, which we usually we feel deeper, I mean, everyone has their own experience, but usually with bipolar two, it's known that you get a deeper depression. We tend to talk about that more because it's, it's so terrible. Right. So I don't know. What do you think, Julie? Yeah. Um, I also think that it's so important. Um, you know, there's that temptation to omit, the truth on a few of the more serious questions, um, you know, for fear of being judged or, you know, stigma was all over my mind going into that psychiatrist appointment. So I really didn't know that if I, you know, answered certain questions, certain ways, was I going to be rolled off in a stretcher in a straitjacket? And, you know, those were legitimate fears. And so my, my biggest piece of advice is to just go in there, be 100% honest, and also share the things that might seem insignificant to you. So I have a friend and for her, hypomania looked like um, going on a road trip when she normally wouldn't. And Mm. so I think when it comes to bipolar and mania, we think of the extremes that we see 
you know, on the media, in the media, and, you know, just whether it's psychosis, or, you know, just extreme behavior. And so for me, though, the signs of hypomania are, you know, extreme creativity, I'm very social, I have, you know, more confidence than I can bottle up. Now that makes up for the downtimes. But you know, from anyone looking um, from the outside, they might just think I'm a blast at a party. I'll, you know, get up and sing karaoke. But for me, it would be so important for me to let a doctor know that I don't always feel that way. And that's definitely something that I feel, you know, in a wave that washes over me for a week or two. And so um, all of those tidbits that we share are just pieces of the puzzle, and they can all help a doctor, you know, hopefully give us a proper diagnosis. But I think that's something I would like to share. And then also, I know so many people are just terrified of that, Mm. the words bipolar disorder. So Mm. the reality is we're struggling. And if there's a name and a diagnosis that can go with our struggles that can give us a starting point and a place, you know, an answer and something that we can dig into and research or connect with other people, Um, then that's amazing. But I think so many of us still, and Shaylee and I talk about this, it's still hard to get those words out. If we're meeting someone for the first time and we are, you know, letting them know that we have bipolar disorder there, there are still those five or 10 seconds after we drop the news, um, which shouldn't really be dropping news, but it still can feel that way where, you know, we're just not sure what the other person's thinking. Um, you know, so I would just, Oh, it's a reason um, and an answer, not an excuse, but the words bipolar disorder. I just, I hope we get to the point where the fear of those words and the weight that they still Mm, carry, um, you know, gets lightened. Yes. And I love, sorry, we piggyback (laughs) off each other a lot. I love what you said, Julie. And I think what we're saying, as I'm thinking, I'm trying to think back of when I was really sick and a lot of what we're saying to do takes a lot of self-reflective capacity, which you might not have. when you're feeling this way. So I think it's really important to have someone like to talk to someone that you trust and someone that sees, because you don't always see your behavior when you're in it, especially hypomania. Like I'm like zoomed in. I don't see um, everything. And like Julie said, you know, your baseline, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, yes, that might seem weird for that person. Right. But then another person might travel all the time. You almost have to know your baseline and what's out of character for you, right? Mm Because I'll spend more money, but I'm not going to buy a boat like they would show on TV or that may happen if you get full blown mania. But you know, start a lot of Amazon packages start showing up or, or little things like that. So I think you actually, sometimes we don't have the self reflective capacity. So if there's someone safe, you can tell and even bring like, I just think it'll further Uh, uh, your help with a doctor if you have other people's uh, you know that you're close to that you trust um uh, insight I don't know if that's helpful no that's very helpful I think both of you brought up like really really good points and and um and also going off of uh you know what Julie said too is like the uniqueness in how some of the symptoms get manifested because you're right you know you you two share where it's like it doesn't always look like you're buying a boat, you know, like things can look yeah. different. And I think it is helpful too, then to, if, cause the journaling, you know, doing the reflections, that's great, but you're right. Like sometimes maybe that might be a little challenging at first. Um, but also in an even supplemental is, um, someone that knows you too, that you feel safe with, that you could talk yeah. to and kind of do that open talking, or maybe even them being like, this is a little different today. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they'll kind of also, um, be able to help like pick up on that as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and you're mm-hmm. right. And I'm, I'm sure you've, especially because you work with a lot of bipolar people or people that live with bipolar disorder, like people tell me to journal. And I, I like, I, I get, I could now because I take medicine or whatever, but it's like certain things that would seem helpful to um, other people might not be for someone that's in a manic state or manic, like, uh, uh, so you have to find your own way that it works. So I'll like verbally, like mm-hmm. into, a, uh, into something. So you have to get it out on paper. But I remember um, it just feeling so misunderstood because I couldn't do the things like same with uh, Julie. And I always laugh, like I cannot color. Like, I, I'm just like, I get, I get so stressed out about <laughs> it's supposed to calm me down. But I'm just like, when am I supposed to be done? What color should I use? I don't know. Uh, uh. And then so people kept sending me coloring books when I first got diagnosed. And I'm like, oh my God, no. Stop. 
<laughs> so I love that you said, you know, journaling might not work for you at first because it's true. And not that journaling is awesome. And I just had to realize that I need to do it in a different way, like not with a pen. <laughs> yeah. Even if yeah. it's simple as a calendar and a yeah. number rating, how am I totally. feeling in the morning? How am I feeling in the evening? And then to be able to bring that to a doctor and say, okay, let's, let's look yes. at a month and what that looks like. I definitely did not do that. And that probably would have helped um, yeah. also. Yeah. 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 So there's, there's multiple options, which is nice, you know, I think, and too, um, for anyone listening, if you wanted to, I think, cause I, I love working with bipolar disorder. That's like my, my heart. And I think <laughs> oftentimes even I get some who they may not have that support person or like when they're talking and it's kind of like dismissed or like, oh, I don't know, you know, and it's not, so it's not really also being like, reflected back sometimes, then, uh, you know, I always tell them, well, like you're here with me. So what's what we're going to do here? Or I'm going to go through and we're going to, mm. you know, whether it's over the timeline of our therapy or just because I do pretty comprehensive intake where I'm also trying to f- find out their unique, you know, symptoms, like how does it actually get expressed? Is that different than the usual, which you normally do, you know? So then to, um, you know, also with a, with a specialist who can, who's very aware of, kind of the nuances and like can be possible fluctuations and really just, I'm very curious. So I think that's also why I think I kind of dive into, cause mm-hmm. I, I really um, want to know, but, um, but yeah, so thanks for saying those tips. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, shifting gears a little, I'm curious, total shifting gears here Yeah, for both of you, you know, cause I've been listening to like the podcast for a while, but like, how did you two meet and like, how did the podcast like happen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to start with how I yeah. heard you do yes. it and you take you it over? Yeah, sure. Okay. You start. <laughs> so um we have a mutual friend and Julie was um spoke at her church. And so she was telling me she knew that the mutual friend knew, knew that I was doing the sisters and mental illness online and that I had started speaking about it. And she said, Hey, oh my goodness, you're not gonna believe this. Someone's with my church. She's local, like look her up. So I'm like started insta stalking, right? And then just just, you know, liking and commenting back and forth over the bit. So it felt like we like knew each other. And then I read her book. And um, yeah, we just kind of kept talking. And then um, we it was literally like the week, the week before I was like, going to I never remember when it's World Bipolar Day and what a failure as a mental health advocate, honestly, <laughs> but I never remember. And so um, it was like literally a couple of days before I'm like, we should collaborate or do something. I'm like, yep. Yeah. I'm like, but it's in two days. And Julie's like, oh yeah. <laughs> so then it started off as that, mm-hmm. talking about that. And then, then COVID hit and we didn't do a Bipolar Day collab. What did we do, Julie? Go. Let's go big or go home. <laughs> But um, yeah, I'll just go back a bit. So we actually ended up first connecting a little bit through the mutual friend, but mostly online, which is just such a great um, tool. And I think social media can be absolutely used for fantastic things. And so if I hadn't come forward with my story, Shaylee and I, we would not be here right now and the podcast would not exist. So there's a little plug for in your own time when you're comfortable. Um, There really is. Mm-hmm. amazing power in coming forward and connecting with other people walking a similar path. And so, um, yes, Shaylee and I connected and we are both creative, passionate people and <laughs> it is miraculous, but in, at the height of the lockdown, when we were literally not allowed out, we dreamed up this podcast slash blog and we just, you know, the ball just kept rolling. And I think when you get to passionate mental health advocates together and the similarities in our stories and right down to the year we were diagnosed our actual diagnosis right down to maybe a tattoo around our ankles (laughs) are are the same and so yes I mean it was just this instant connection we do feel like we've known each other our whole lives but and you know we each cover off different parts of the podcast Shaylee's more on the social media side I love the technical editing aspect of the episodes and so it's it's just been amazing and I think our goal at the beginning was to just put a few more faces of bipolar disorder um, out into the world and build a community where people can feel heard and supported and it's 
exceeded our wildest dreams. Um, Shaley, I know you would agree. Our goal was to reach even one person and help them feel less alone. And yeah, boom, we just, yeah. So we're, we're just so excited, so grateful to our community. Mm -hmm. um, Shaley, I don't know if you want to add in any more about, about the yeah. podcast, but. Yeah, I think it's so funny because people think we're like, we have hung out a total of three times in real life. Yeah. And one of them, we recorded an episode in a base baseball dugout <laughs> in COVID. And then she had come to an event I was hosting called Wired. Yeah. And then we just saw each other a couple months ago when she was in town. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I know, right? Yeah. We hang out here. We hang out on the interwebs. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, and also, you know, there is good when medicated to hypomania because we yeah. put it to like started talking about it and had it out in a month, maybe yeah. five weeks. Talk. Yeah. <laughs> Graphics, logos, a trailer video. And so, yes, I mean, when the hypomania hits, um, you know, I'm super duper aware now. I make sure, you know, the house, yes. the fridge is stocked. Yeah. Um, even my family's on board helping to keep me well. So at one point I was working, it was like three in the morning and my daughter just said, mom, go to bed, you know how much you need your sleep. And so, you know, thankfully I still have my creative burst of energy and I'm able to manage, um, manage those and hopefully, you know, create things and put them out into the world, which is one of the things that I do actually love about having bipolar disorder. I know a lot of people are like, how could you love anything about it? But I really do feel like so many people living with this disorder are the most creative, vibrant, beautiful, colorful, um, absolute geniuses, um, you know, and the world needs us and our brains think outside the box and differently and more creatively. And so, yeah, yeah I, think and I think, I think people think like they see us and like Julie said, I mean, I get dressed up to go to therapy too, right? Like, of course we're going to put our best yeah. <laughs> foot yeah. forward when, when we're here, but it's not a, like there's not a cure for bipolar disorder. So we, we still have episodes, we still struggle. And we, we really love our hypomania now because we're have a treatment plan because Julie and I have both chosen to take medication, right? So we can harness it. Yeah. It can get out of control, right? We, mm -hmm. we did this and you know, I, it's fun. And we want to tell you, but I don't want to glorify no. yeah. a lot of it. And we're very, we try very hard not to do that. But when you can, you know, it's just a sweet spot when you can have enough, but not too much that it makes you crash. Right. Yeah. And yeah. luckily we feel really grateful that we're in a space that, yeah. you know, that we can do that ourselves or when we can't our community, like your daughter is like, settle yeah. down. Like we have yeah. to shut it down. And and we check in with each other too. And I, you know, we, our family just moved from Canada to the US. And so there was almost two years in there where I, I was a little overwhelmed with the move and Shaylee will, will attest to the fact that I was in a much darker place. I wasn't on social media as much. And oh, it's just so nice to have someone else that understands. And, you know, even with sleeping, if, if we're going through, a bit of hypomania and we're having trouble sleeping, we'll, we'll check in with each other, but yes, absolutely. 100% what Shaylee said. Um, we're still on our journey. Um, you know, it's not linear and I definitely still have, have my ups and downs. So we definitely want to be sure to let everyone know that yes, we're not always this put together and that's okay. And that's part of life. And that's part of this journey. And, you know, so I just want to make sure people out there know that. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, we get that a bit on our, our messages and stuff. And we're just mm. like, No, we're still, we're still here. We just get dressed up. Yeah, it's challenging sometimes with social media, or like media in general, because they not everyone sees the completeness or you're like the whole, you know, and I think mm. they kind of see what's, you know, in front and but every human, you know, and I love that both of you have a treatment that works for you and also getting to know yourself, but mostly like, what started out as like, as like personal and then like work and then turn into like really great, like social support for both of you and like a connection yeah. like that is, I think that's amazing. And that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Could you give like a little, like a snippet of um, what the podcast is about and like what the listeners hear if they listen to like episodes? Sure. Julie, you want to take that one? 
Sure. Well, we cover it all. So you can go all the way back to episode one, and we pretty much start with our journey from childhood. Um, I think our very first episode even has some very embarrassing photos. So definitely worth checking out. But we pretty much walk through our lives from, you know, childhood through to diagnosis. We have episodes about, you know, um, what we had talked about during this episode and then our reactions to our diagnoses. Um, We also talk about stigma. We talk about, we recently did a few episodes on words that help and words that hurt because I know for people walking alongside, it is so hard to know exactly what to do to help, you know? And I think everybody wants to help They just sometimes are terrified of saying or doing the wrong thing. And so we have a few episodes and I, I think I took away just as much as hopefully some of the listeners have just of things to say. And yeah, sometimes it's okay to just be there or listen, you know, you don't always have to say the right thing. Just being there means everything. And now we're working on a few episodes um, about triggers, um, smaller everyday ones, and then bigger ones coping mechanisms. And Shaylee and I get just as much from the feedback that we get back from our listeners. So we're just so grateful, but um, we're hoping in the future too, um, to do more episodes on motherhood. Um, and we've recently also started a series within the podcast, which Shaylee is absolutely amazing and gifted at. And I'll let her explain a little bit more about that, but take it away, yeah. Shaylee. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I just want to tell all the stories I love. (laughs) And I'm the extrovert of the group (laughs) of the duo. Um, And so uh, I, like you had said earlier in my bio, I used to interview um, women with different mental health disorders and we used to talk about it. And then Julie and I talked about doing panels. We just talked about different things. And um, I just wanted to hear more stories, especially as our, you know, Instagram community started growing and growing. People just kept, you know, telling us stories and um, our stories are different, but they overlap a lot. And, you know, we're around the same age. We're both cisgender white women. So I wanted to be able to tell different stories. And so as we started, I started conversations with um, series. And so I'm interviewing all all types of people, folks that um, live with some form of bipolar disorder. And so, yeah, so far... <laughs> feel so bad for our community because we keep saying we're going to be accepting submissions but because with our capacity and Julie and I have other jobs and other you know our family we're very much we put out two a month most months and we put them out on the day that we're feeling good so we're not a podcast that you can come to every Tuesday um but uh we feel like that's pretty on brand for (laughs) for this is bipolar personally but um yeah so I've been interviewing all all different folks and we're um we hope to interview more we because it's quite a large community now we probably get like 15 to 20 asks a day so we're gonna have to go through a process so we're just trying to sort sort that out um and we're gonna put that out so people watch for that probably this spring we're gonna have a way that we can do submissions um, because as much as I'd love to talk to everybody, I, I just can't. And so, yeah, but we're really excited about it. It's been so such uh, a touching time. I feel like they're all my best friends. Julie feels like they're the best friends and she wasn't at the interview, right? She's editing like they're such oh, a- I edit with a big grin on my face. And I, I just love how every single story is so different. And sometimes it's the weirdest, smallest parts of our journey that will connect with someone else that's listening. And so I think we both Mm. realize how powerful and valuable all of our stories are. And, you know, they have the power to connect us all Mm. and heal us individually and collectively. So Mm. we're just committed and so passionate about sharing all of them. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, uh, we talk to like for people that haven't heard of our podcast before it's all real real lived experience yeah so we don't interview you know other disorders right now we don't have a lot of professionals come on yet we're we're hoping to do some things with you but um yeah if you want to come and hear some real live raw stories that's that's what we offer yeah i think that's that's amazing and that's um what i loved about your podcasts as well because like especially now, you know, and oh my gosh, we're like, what, in year two of this pandemic? And, um, but just in general, hearing stories, just like, I'm also a book reader, like reading a book, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's someone's lived experience, and there's pieces of it, or sometimes a lot of it, 
where you feel so connected and like Mm -hmm. seen where and not feel so alone, like in your struggle, like, oh, it isn't just me. You're looking back like, oh yeah, that was me too. Or, you know, just that someone else is experiencing the same thing as you. And then went through similar struggles. You know, I think there are so much power to that, even, even through a podcast that is still conveyed. So that's something that always resonated with me with this is bipolar. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow. Like, and that like authentic piece and just like talking about things like I love, like I told, I I remember when I initially heard your, your podcast, I was telling a lot of people about it, like personally and professionally, because that's important. And then also the niche of also bipolar disorder, I felt was very, very important for people to know about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll, we are just about out of time, actually. (laughs) Thank you so much, both of you for being here. This was, this was fun. Um, I love doing this. And um, so for the listeners, if they wanted to find out more about you or the podcast, any particular social media handles, I'm just, I think I know the podcast is on pretty much all platforms, I think, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's everywhere. So we do most of our connecting with our community on our Instagram. So it's at this period is period bipolar. And so we do a lot there, but yeah, it's everywhere. We have a YouTube channel. The podcast can be found wherever you listen to your podcast, same title. And, um, and we also do have it on, on YouTube as well. So you can watch the video on Instagram or YouTube or like, we're just, we just thought we could put it out on as many places as we could, because we just know so many people are struggling in silence. And we thought, you know what, wherever they can find us would be, would be great. And we would just love, love to hear from you. If you're someone that, that comes and joins us over on our Instagram or listens, our favorite thing is to hear, hear from people. Cause we also like to know that we're not alone. Right. Yeah. yeah. And we're always open to episode ideas or topics. Mm. So it's, yeah, it's fantastic. We love interacting with our community. Great. What I'll do is um, I'll put that the social media handle in um, the show notes and then for the YouTube channel for this, um, I'll put it in the description so people can just easily click on it. But yeah, I love your, your Instagram as well. So it's like a really good community, I feel like. So, Mm -hmm. so yeah, well, thank you both of you again for doing this. It was great having you on lovely chatting with you. And I'm like, that's so excited when you both agreed. I was like, yeah, (laughs) thanks for having us. We're always thrilled. We're blown away when we, you know, find others that are passionate about the same thing. And so I know I speak for Shaylee and myself. We're just so honored to be here. So thank you for having us. Yeah. And we're yeah. going to keep in touch because you are now one of our best friends. So. Oh, yay. Welcome. Yay. 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 <laughs> All right. We'll take care. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.